Council of Sri Lanka. Today's session is conducted by Dr. Nareen Pereira on topic of urban climate lessons from Colombo, Sri Lanka, challenges and opportunities. So let me introduce the today's resource person. Dr. Narain Pereira is a chartered architect by profession and a senior lecturer in architecture and at the University of Morito, Sri Lanka. His architectural practice prides itself on the degree of innovation and holistic applicability of its architectural solutions. He has won recognition for design both locally and internationally. He was the recipient of the Young Architect of the Year in 2010. On the international stage, he was awarded the Architecture Asia Award for Emerging Architects by ARCA SIA 2014 and 2016 and the Energy and Hot Climates Prize of the Green Building Solutions Award 2016 for the International Platform France. Dr. Pera's research expertise primarily emphasize urban scale studies that focus on the tropical climate context. He critically explores the impacts of the haphazard and rapid development that affects tropical cities. His research includes a local climate zone based approach to urban planning Colombo, Sri Lanka. Dear sir, over to you. Good evening to you all. <coughs> My thanks are go out to the uh, Green Building Council of Sri Lanka for inviting me to uh, share some of my work and my research, um, especially focusing on Colombo, Sri Lanka. And um, I like to introduce you all to the urban scale it has become uh, very important uh, right throughout uh, the world these days with extreme events etc. So I take this opportunity to uh, enlighten you on some uh, aspects that we, we, can, we as responsible professionals can take on uh, going forward in our careers. And so in, in this session <coughs> I have turned it urban climate lessons from Colombo, Sri Lanka. So uh, the format of it, I will uh, try to allude to the challenges that we will face and then some opportunities that uh, are, uh, are afforded to us to overcome these uh, challenges. So I take this uh, presentation in, uh, in three parts or three lessons I have put it down as lessons but each one is connected to each other. Right? So the first part I will introduce you all to the local climate zone uh, some of you um, will know of this uh, initiative and um, the other two parts um, the lesson number two and lesson three I draw upon this local climate zone based approach or local climate zone mapping uh, to identify urban heat risk and what we can uh, take from that and also in terms of uh, microclimatic impacts. Right? So microclimate as uh, an important factor of where we live and where uh, we inhabit in cities, in livable cities. Right? So this is an outline of the presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, tropical climate. So this, this is a, a very basic map, but uh, says a lot. We are um, Geographically, where we are, 
and what are the challenges that a tropical climate faces, uh, what we face in terms of uh, challenges. So we all know that the, the tropical zone that we inhabit is warm and is humid. Right? So then uh, immediately challenges that we face how are we going to achieve the comfort, especially by passive means? Because we know that uh, if you go for um, strategies that are not passive, means that we are using energy more and more. And with more and more energy use, uh, we um, make the problem uh, more acute. Right? So here, the challenges uh, that we face are high humidity. We know that evaporating heat loss um, helps us thermoregulate. And therefore, uh, because of high humidity, we find it difficult. Weak macro level winds, right? like, like the time we are facing today. You know, the sun is directly overhead these few days. And with it, we have weak macro level wind conditions. So therefore, we, we can not really depend on a wind based um, strategy for passive uh, comfort, etc. And then seasonality. We know that we rarely face the seasons that we see in the temperate countries or, or in, the, uh, in the northern hemisphere in particular, you know, where seasonality all around we have uh, a situation where it is warm and it is humid. A little bit of change is where um, we face with precipitation, with more uh, more rain or less rain. Right? So that, that's the only variation, slight variation that we see, but in most cases, we don't have seasons. High enthalpy. With high enthalpy, it makes it much more difficult for us to achieve thermal comfort because we need more and more energy to achieve it. With these challenges um, are exacerbated by local and global climatic changes. Um, we know that we create local uh, changes and local warming and with it, we impact global. Vice versa, with global climate changes, we impact the local. So all of this ties together and the, with the already warm, humid, tropical climate is a phenomenon called urban heat wave. The urban heat island effect, you all will know, that is a, a phenomenon where the cities or the more urbanized areas are warmer than its uh, surrounding context. So uh, common sense tells us with uh, excess heat or difficulty in the urbanized areas or the cities to cool down and for, and for its inhabitants to be comfortable, we use more and more energy. So this is a becomes a vicious cycle. Our urban contexts are warming. We are using more and more energy and with more and more energy, we expend or we use scarce resources. And it, it is a what we call a vicious cycle that we must uh, break. But this urban heat island phenomenon also serves as a base. So in trying to mitigate or adapt to the urban heat island, we can uh, try to mitigate and to adapt to these uh, situations. So here as a case study, I use studies from Kalambo, Sri Lanka. We know uh, geographically where we are on the western coast just an image and it is uh, fast changing you know, in terms of land use patterns, build morphology, right? we see rapid development in certain areas. So right throughout the um, 
throughout history these few uh, graphics we can see that how thermal comfort and uh, in the thermal comfort in the hottest months of the year and the coldest months of the year how it has changed over the years from 1996 to 2020 right? what is important here is that we are looking at what impacts people what impacts people occupying cities right it is not uh, thermal trends in general or in terms of meteorology or on the meso scale on the macro scale right so we are not talking about those things here we are talking about people and how people uh, who inhabit cities are comfortable and how we can make it better so here these uh, maps that show how thermal comfort has increased from 1996 to 2020 and especially in the Colombo region so we can clearly see the more urbanized area of Colombo is um, drastically impacted so here urban warming is an eminent threat but it also forms a catalyst to rethink the way we plan and therefore an opportunity to build healthy resilient cities and so here research or mapping or, or historical data that is uh, analyzed shows us there is a problem that is building up we have recognized the problem and we should uh, react to it so in trying to understand how to react to it i draw on the first aspect a local climate zone based approach to urban planning right so local climate zone i will um, explain more in the upcoming so here we, we know that manipulating the urban fabric to mitigate and adapt to warming trend in high density tropics do it right so rapidly and then the need the urban fabric and the, uh, the, the morphology of the cities are changing because it is growing. Therefore, manipulating it becomes a key strategy. However, because we need excessive data and with it analytical methods, we know that uh, data collection, analysis, all that needs a lot of resources, not only economic resources, uh, manpower, uh, all of that. And also because, because we need to, uh, the tropical regions, we are trying to develop quickly and therefore we take uh, quick fire decisions. So, so most of the time they are uncoordinated and uh, because of the uncoordinated or uninformed decision making, the problem is um, pro the, the solutions themselves pose barriers. So the way forward is to understand our problem, especially on the um, microclimatic level. What is the microclimatic background condition that climate sensitive urban policy needs to be based upon? Right? So we need to ask ourselves of that question. So to understand that, as I mentioned earlier, we base it on the urban heat island phenomenon. Right? In understanding what drives urban heat island, we can mitigate and adapt and also the local climate zone that we i will introduce is, has the ability to be applied quickly and especially in a data scarce context 
లైక్ శ్రీలంక local climate zones was formulated to fill a crucial void in the uhi methodology right so earlier before the local climate zone um, protocols the people looked at urban to rural temperature differences right so here as it's shown in this diagram the urban area is warmer than the rural areas but the definition of what is urban and what is rural was problematic and it didn't transcend uh, geographical boundaries etc so the idea was to now see if you take this diagram we can see that the urban area or the built types or built areas can be quite different similarly the rural areas or the land cover types could be different but the when we communicate the temperature differences between the um, different patterns then it is not doesn't paint the same picture right so sometimes the say a more dense urban area also classified as urban the temperature difference between that and a land cover may be different to one that is less dense but it is still right so this is a main argument uh, or the main problem that the local climate zone um, approached where the temperature difference or urban heat island intensity was based on the difference between the local climate zones i will explain further and we must remember that we are talking about the uh, urban heat island phenomenon in the urban canopy layer right urban canopy layer so this diagram on the right side shows us and we know that there are different types of urban heat island or different urban heat island types but we which is the three dimensional space that we as people we as human beings occupy while on the meso scale on the larger scale macro scale what the what the meteorologist will uh, communicate those heat islands are uh, different to the area the micro scale or the urban canopy layer heat islands the three dimensional space as uh, urban designers engineers architects etc we and also in the cost that we occupy um, so that's the concentration here so the local climate zone looks at the local scale right so the area that is uh, from 100 square meters to uh, 10 to the power 4 or 10000 square meters so it is on a local scale so it is the area uh, that will change so we know that when we are moving through a city be it uh, so it will be uh, different parts of the city we will feel different temperatures no some areas it's all all urban all urban all the areas that we are moving through are urban but we do feel differences so there are local level changes so this local climate zone tries to pinpoint those and while we talk about uh, physical aspects of it the local climate zone incorporates climate right so now in our planning and building regulations etc we talk mostly of the physical form of cities physical morphology etc but in the local climate zone it is configured in such a way that it includes climate so therefore any classification or modification of the urban morphology will pick up on 
physical as well as climate. And we look at um, the system as a uh, uh, zone or a area of characteristic properties so that we can recognize certain trends. Right? We will talk more on those. And these are these types. So they broke the uh, Stuart and Oak, uh, Ian Stuart. Um, he broke the urban areas into uh, several patterns, 10 patterns. And the land cover types, the space between buildings, spaces that surround urban uh, contexts as um, land cover types, seven, so 17 in all. So, uh, these two charts or the, the, uh, the what we call data sheets explain the metadata or the properties of a local climate zone. Right? The, the chart on the right shows you definitions. Um, when we use observational, we can observe these uh, different patterns from above, from, uh, from street level, etc. And then when we map these, we have these zone properties. These zone properties uh, range. So each local climate zone will have a specific range of these properties. These red bars show that. And these zone properties have physical, uh, physical morphological factors like sky view factor, aspect ratio, building height. All those are to do with the physical aspects of it. The shape of the um, built building, uh, built fabric within a particular zone. Then it will also have surface or land cover properties or surface properties. Right? We know that. Uh, if you know urban heat island, we know that the form of the buildings, materials of buildings, etc. will drive UHI. It will absorb and uh, obstruct radiation loss in the night. Right? Similarly, the surfaces, with, without, uh, when we have paving, asphalt, etc., we have a situation where evaporative um, cycles cannot happen and that is also an urban heat island driver right so the second aspect first aspect is physical second parameters or properties are uh, land cover or surf surface um, aspects and the third is uh, metabolic that means uh, people occupying the urban context so anthropogenic heat flux is the typical a uh, way we think about uh, these kinds of uh, anthropogenic in terms when we say anthropogenic means man generated or uh, generated by us uh, so it is the vehicle emissions in our cities it is the waste energy from say air conditioning uh, energy use etc so so we can see so each of these properties or parameters or parameter ranges will define a local climate zone. Right? So now this example is uh, compact low rise. Right? So uh, like this, for all 17 zones, you will have a data sheet. So in recognizing a zone, we know it is uh, a shape. It has a particular shape and form. It is a, It has a a particular um, material and a surface cover profile and it has a, a metabolic profile as well. Right? So we are not talking only physical here. Yeah? All climatic aspects are also included. So this the next few slides uh, we talk about how we went about classifying for Colombo Sri Lanka. Uh, this uh, map This map generated uh, in 2012 
2012, uh, we can see that uh, most of the city is, was classified as LZZ3 or Local Climate Zone 3, compact low rise, compact mid rise, or large low rise. So the yellows and the oranges in this map. No? So most of our building stock is uh, residential, and then we have these large low rise areas, uh, typical institutional buildings where they are large and they cover, they are not tall, but they, are, they have a large footprint like schools, universities, uh, the warehouses around Beire Lake, etc. So it is, this map is clear. And it shows, also shows that, showed that Colombo is not densely, densely built. Right? So the red area showed um, compact high rise areas which were minimal in uh, when we mapped in 2012. It also showed significant percentage of, percentage of local climate zone 7 that is um, lightweight low rise or areas that the underserved settlements uh, occupy. Right? The grey areas we can clearly see along um, canal banks, uh, railway lines, etc. Right? So those were significant. So this immediately gives us a picture of the morphology or the uh, simplified version of the shape of Kalambo. Then next we asked with this, with this uh, morphological aspects of it, what is the urban heat island uh, impact or intensity? And so then when we uh, calculated or went into what is the urban heat island impact, we can see the more dense uh, local climate zones were warmer, right? So this, these contexts were much more warm than the less dense and the land cover areas. So almost four degrees warmer if it is a compact high rise as opposed to open high rise or open mid rise, sorry, yeah, yeah, open low rise or um, patterns that are less dense. So we can see that with density, local warming is also uh, high. With that knowledge, we can see if we develop if we develop the city in a certain way, if we develop uh, or build planning and building regulations, if we define it in, in such a way so that um, it changes the local climate zone, what happens? Now this map on the right hand side shows you according to planning and building regulations for 2030, of the UDA, we can see that most buildings or most plots, if you have the footprint, you can build tall. And in this local climate zone system, and a high rise building or a compact high rise context is um, any building more than 25 meters. Right? So that's a eight story building. It doesn't have to be a 30 or 100 story building for for that pattern to have a significant impact, any building over 25 meters uh, is classified as compact high rise. Right? So this map shows you that most plots, now this the orange area is the, uh, you know, Colombo 7, Colombo 5, right? So those areas are kept um, uh, mid rise, while all other areas theoretically have the possibility to be high rise and this chart on the left hand shows you what happens when uh, compact mid rise areas becomes a compact high rise areas or areas that are less dense becomes more dense it's the area in the red box shows you that when we take areas that are open low rise or lightweight low rise and then we build tall or we build um, 
compact high rise areas we can see how much the temperature or the urban heat island intensity increases uh, unfortunately this is what we are doing in most most uh, cases especially in terms of lightweight low rise no we have taken uh, areas um, areas like that underserved areas lightweight low rise areas we have demolished and we have built even in um, uh, urban areas for tsunami housing etc uh, we have built extremely dense right so there with that we have taken that option we know that that is not the only option um, we can see that how much we have impacted so the local climate zone system allows us to see what impact our decision making can have on the local climate or the on the urban heat island intensity of the area we are uh, creating policy for right? so here we can see the greatest intensity was when uh, lightweight low rise areas were made into compact high rise areas sahaspura you know meedusenpura all those all those are that kind of um, development then we saw that the there is a possibility we are already developed areas already dense areas here mark for more development has less impact And we also see that uh, reuse when we don't change morphology, right? So we we see that uh, old warehouses are reused, uh, arcade, um, race course, um, areas like that, like the Chalmers granaries, areas that are the morphology doesn't change. Development happens, uh, change of use happens, but the morphology itself doesn't change. So when we look at those kinds of areas the impacts or urban heat island impacts are not as much so Kalambo, so this i mentioned it was 2010 2012 the lgz map continues to evolve right so this is 2018 we can see much more um, compact high rise areas and also we can see the growing port, the black areas that are, are asphalt. It, it is a, we know concrete and asphalt that uh, in terms of a surface cover, it's pretty intensive. And you can see this, the, the what you call the planned uh, extent, no? it's a significant extent when compared to uh, the existing city. And here we see uh, port city growing. Right now it is only sand, no, some of the areas. And then we can see with the projected Colombo Metropolitan Region Development Plan of 230, 2030, these areas also can become compact high rise. So this is something that we can, we need to think about. So the opportunity in understanding our cities our context in terms of a local climate zone is that we recognize it in terms of its morphology its geometric and surface cover and also in terms of uh, thermal and anthropogenic properties right? as i mentioned so therefore climatic so with uh, understanding that we can identify critically stressed areas what are the areas that are um, which are intensive therefore how we can mitigate and adapt what areas should we let be right we can all the areas need not develop in a similar manner we can have pockets of development and then areas that are less uh, needs less development so it it, it uh, creates a, um, a different pattern rather than a homogeneous uh, uh, one set of regulations for all. 
right so that that is one big advantage in the lgz or local climate zone approach in using this local climate zone for the second part or uh, lesson 2 uh, we draw upon uh, a urban heat risk map that was developed for colombo so it is based on the uh, one part of it is on the morphology that we have recognized as a local climate zone and then it draws on other factors as well so urban heat risk so urban heat risk protocols for mapping and implications for colombo sri lanka and we uh, again we concentrate on people in the city right we are designing we are creating cities for its inhabitants um, the uh, what you call the uh, comfort of its inhabitants so global and local warming trends we see more and more create heat risk in cities especially in the poorer parts of the world weak infrastructure poverty and an aging population make this risk more acute in developing cities right more heat waves we have we, we in sri lanka have not really seen this kind of impacts but our neighboring countries we can see people dying because of uh, heat waves etc especially the aging uh, age no and also uh, the need for developing fine grain heat risk maps especially as i mentioned in data poor tropical regions where we can pinpoint and then build objectives for climate sensitive urban planning um, to help those uh, cities uh, inhabitants live well or increase the livability so to develop this heat risk map for colombo we looked at several uh, factors or several parameters that go into um, identifying or uh, including several parameters that go, are included in recognizing these uh, stressed highly stressed areas right so morphological right so this diagram shows you uh, both uh, physical um in terms of socio economic in terms of uh, climate and also in terms of vulnerability right so these are the factors or parameters that we included so it uh, looked at the physical parameters and local climate zone was one part of it then we took at population density uh the the sensitivity of the population in terms of age etc land use types uh, income levels uh, and then also we used um, remote sensed to uh, look at uh, land surface temperatures etc and all of these were brought together uh, under uh, apa right uh, 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 analytical hierarchical hierarchical process so that we give weightage for each of these factors having given a weightage uh, we were able to garner the hazard the exposure and how vulnerable uh, each of these uh, communities are to um heat or urban heat we bought all these and assigning a weightage and ranking we developed a, a map so these are the weightages that were assigned right so we can see uh the parameters 
in terms of household status, uh, land use, whether built up vegetation or bare, and then ranking in terms of subclass uh, parameters of LCZs or local climate zones. Right, so if we take for example local climate zone because I just ex uh, explained it to you. So the more dense areas, the compact high rise areas were uh, more critical. So the ranking was given a higher weightage. Right, so the, the people living in compact high rise areas that are low income, that have high land surface temperatures etc. were more at risk. Right? So more at risk. So that is the rationale. So in overlaying all of these factors and giving weightage, this is the map that is that was generated. The green areas are low risk areas. The yellow areas are moderate risk, while high risk areas are red. Right, so we see most of the high risk areas are uh, north of Colombo, the north side of Colombo, no? um, Kotehena, Kochikade. We know that um, the building density and even the uh, social economic status is uh, not that great. No, the density is uh, high, and then. Um, those kinds of factors and then we also see in the south of Colombo right so the canal banks um, that area so you can see uh, again socio-economic status the how the uh, people live etc and then we also see the more high dense areas that are coming up now the high rise quarters even though uh, so that is that that pattern maybe is generated because of the built morphology the energy used and and the, and the waste energy that is um, generated and so we can see patterns while again we can see the Colombo 7 Colombo 5 uh, areas and Bear Lake you know, those thing, those patterns are evident. We are open, green cover, uh, less dense, more uh, socio-economically better position people, uh, inhabitants. You no, know, we can see the risk level is low. So opportunities are even having this kind of map we can pinpoint hotspots right so certain areas that are problematic how we can tackle them right how we can mitigate or areas that are less problematic how we can preserve right so not a situation that we will have the same policy or same approach to every uh, area, all areas of a uh, context. So this gives us the opportunity to have uh, context specific intervention. Right? Context specific intervention for overall amelioration, right? overall um, mitigation and adaptation to to heat risk, right? So this is heat risk in special, in in uh, in specific, right? In, so these are how vulnerable are people in our city? Which areas are vulnerable? Which areas are not vulnerable? And therefore, how how we uh, formulate our planning and building regulations? Uh, the, the the third part. that I will uh, take on drawing from microclimatic impacts of high-rise cluster 
developments right so this is um, projected development of port city right so this is the uh, in terms of morphological changes or built environment changes in colombo so this is the most intensive plan area uh, that we know no these are the, the, the biggest changes in comparison to other areas yes we have area certain pockets of high rise buildings coming up but this area uh, in comparison as a total area we know that um, there is a definite development plan so these are some images from the competitions that they had and also the plan morphology several views and we can see the taller parts the taller parts or the more dense high rise areas are closest to the existing city here we can see the twin towers and the bank of ceylon and the, the, the presidential secretariat etc but the the highest development is planned for the block next to it so these are some images from the uh, people who won the competition, Skidmore, Owens and Merrill, SOM, international, highly reputed international firm. And so we know that we can see that the much of the development of Port City is high rise. Right? So com compact urban forms that we create to minimize space and energy more often is in the form of high-rise developments. The problem is that each high-rise doesn't talk to the other high-rise buildings in that context. Right? Most of the time they will focus on their own building or own building skin or building envelope. So what happens is, yes, they will take on very energy efficient um, responsible building patterns but they stop at their outer envelopes they don't um, take it as a cluster it is not, so they are standalone entities but we know that it cannot be that it must take on a urban um, impact on a urban microclimate we know that building by building consider a loan won't solve the problem. So to understand this, uh, we looked at um, how ventilation or uh, how to improve Sorry, I lost you all. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so we looked at the morphology. The morphology or the build uh, shape of uh, Port City and how it will impact the wind uh, regime around and for the whole city and we used a pollutant dispersion as a proxy. Right? Wind is very difficult to, to model. So we are using uh, pollution dispersion or carbon monoxide. 
as a proxy to understand what the built morph morphology will do. So to do that, we looked at uh, the form of the towers, right? These are defined, the, the flow area ratios and the plot coverage uh, of the, uh, the, these particular plots are defined in the uh, Port City plan. So we are using that. Uh, giving those uh, uh, flow area ratios, we can decide on the shape of the tower and the, what we call the podium, right? The podium is the, uh, the lower flows that uh, can occupy a higher area than the towers. Uh, our regulations uh, dictate that the towers can occupy only 50% of a particular plot, but, but the, the podium can occupy um, 80%, right? So that's the rationale that we have used. So the simulation, the, the morphology we talk about, what happens when there is a, only a tower, that is this uh, first series. Then when there is a block podium, that means all the flows in the podium are of the same footprint, that is the second line. And in the third line, when the, the podium is tiered, that means when the podium is going up, uh, it is getting set back. And so this is basically morphological change and what happens to the, uh, the pollutant dispersion properties. So these are some uh, simulation results or maps, right? So the first line shows you uh, a plan view cut at a, at a certain height or at uh, cut at the uh, pedestrian height or the screen height where we occupy. And uh, the second line are sections. The blue area on the right hand side of the maps is the old city, right? Old city or Colombo city. So we can see that with the shapes, the pollutant trapping within the port city streets are intensive. While some forms, uh, the tower only podium, et cetera, tower only uh, option, we have pollution, uh, what, what can I say, leaking out into the whole city or impacting the whole city. While some uh, don't. In section, we can see how intensive is this um, uh, pollution trapping, right? or pollutant trapping and then what pollutant uh, concentrations will impact the whole city. Similarly, this is tower form two with a more perpendicular to the wind direction. The wind is blowing from the west. And we can see this tower form and it's podium forms, um, we can see, unlike the other, we can see the pollutant plume going over the whole city. And some areas are, um, don't, are not impacted when we compare the previous form of tower. This is a third form where the uh, tower footprints are smaller and uh, parallel to the wind direction, we can see how the pollutant impacts are increased in comparison. But the pollutant uh, concentrations or, or within the port city streets are um, eased. No? So the pollutant is, uh, are, won't get trapped, but we can see the escaping or, or, or the impacting of the whole city is greater in comparison to the other forms. So we can see that uh, in trying to understand the morphological changes, uh, there is no one solution fit for. No? Some are good for its for the port city and vice versa. Right? Some push the pollutant 
above the built areas, but some are trapped within the streets. So to understand this, um, excessive data needs. Uh, so in other countries, they will have, even if you design a single building, you will have to go through, uh, you, you will have to show how it impacts in terms of the total city or the total local area, you know, in terms of simulations, in terms of um, wind tunnel tests, et cetera. And we know that, that it is extremely resource uh, extensive. But we have also opportunities to understand this problem in terms of at an early stage. And then whether we can tackle this at approval stages, right? where these buildings are not yet built and the regulations are only set down at the moment. Can we have a situation where we look at the what kind of building and how it impacts the uh, city can be looked at uh, more uh, carefully? This is not a new phenomenon. No, we have uh, situations, say, take for example, Hong Kong, right? They are building planning and building regulations are based on air ventilation assessment. Right, also on pollutant dispersal. Uh, those of you can remember, um, Hong Kong was a, a country or a state that were highly impacted by SARS, SARS before COVID, no SARS. And then one thing was the, they couldn't flush out. It is a, it's a airborne um, scenario. They couldn't flush it out because the density of building in Hong Kong trapped it. Trapped the bad air, as, as it were. So they came up with a situation where air ventilation assessment, how air should move through an urban context. Right? So much so, they will uh, dictate the porosity of a building. You can't have a solid block. You, can, you have to have break it up so that the air must pass through, etc. And then we can push it some more. No? Now, this, this study theoretically looked at uh, pollutant dispersal, right? These um, pollutants are air conditioning and most uh, significantly is uh, vehicular traffic. So what if somebody says um, no uh, vehicular traffic in Port City, right? If it is only... Um, electric, only walking, only bicycles, etc. So then the pollutants are, uh, you completely take out the pollutant. And then uh, in terms of building emissions also, we can, uh, we can define this, we can put it down because it's an opportunity to know uh, what impacts that can have. And then therefore avoid rather than adapt and mitigate. So that's some food for thought uh, in terms of, um, so my message is to understand your problem, understand your challenge, and then you can look at um, opportunities to make it better, right? We looked at local climate zone and urban heat island, the urban heat island phenomenon as a base to understand uh, both the morphology and the climatic aspects of urban context. And therefore how we can, um, increase health and quality of life in a city. Now we know that environmental pollution has significant costs. Uh, the links, we need links between environment, health and well-being, right? So these are often ignored, unfortunately. Um, we know that climate change is uh, not just an environmental issue. It is a health issue. Right? People are affected and therefore bringing environment, health and well-being of, the, of its people together um, rather than separately. No? We have to bring it and look at it. Although it is complex, uh, we have to look at it in a holistic and uh, 
holistic way so that ben it benefits all society. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Peksha Rajini. Hope everyone uh, is audible. Hope, hope I am audible to you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm Peksha Rajini, the general manager of Great Building Council of Sri Lanka. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Narayan Pereira for having this uh, very informative session. Uh, so. Uh, uh, of course, you all may have a lot of questions to ask him and uh, please direct them, uh, direct those questions to chat box. Until you uh, send your uh, questions, I would like to uh, make this opportunity uh, to announce, um, announce the winners of our green quiz competition. So we had a, uh, we had a green quiz competition on 24th August, uh, 2022. And now I'm going to announce the winners. Okay, uh, so the third place goes to um, MGLK Ravi Hansel, University of Peradeniya. The second place goes to Hemangi Maladharma from University of Maratur and the first place, the winner of the winner uh, Green Quiz Competition 2022 is uh, Isuru Anuradha Koditoaku from Rajarata University of Sri Lanka. So congratulations for uh, your great achievement. And uh, all three winners are uh, uh, given uh, cash prizes and uh, they will we will proceed it with it. So uh, also uh, the participants who had achieved over 80 uh, points are given a valuable certificate. Uh, I, I would like to uh, uh, tell, speak out the names. The um, Batusha uh, Tushia, Tushantan from University of Vaunia, Haritra Navaratnam from University of Maratur, Samita Nadishani from uh, Sri Lanka Technological Campus, AIF uh, Sajiha uh, from University of Kalania, G. Ashen Ravindu Silva from University of Maratur, uh, Soli, Sojika J, Jainathan from University of Ruhuna, uh, Tushana Uttar Ute Kumar from University of Colombo, Christine Hamid from University of Kalania, HW West Gunatunga from University of Maratur, uh, H. Abdul Halik from University of Maratur, RT Netmini uh, from University of Ruhuna, H. S. M. Sena Ratna from Sabaragamu University of Sri Lanka, S. W. V. R. Dharmaratna from Sabaragamu University of Sri Lanka. So congratulations everyone for your great achievement. And uh, now we can move on to the Q&A session. Thank you. So if you have any question, uh, you can just uh, unmute and talk or at least uh, uh, send, uh, send them through the chat box. Yes, um, you can unmute and ask questions. Uh, yes, I have uh, received one question. 
so uh, he's asking uh, to how to uh, to elaborate the condition of uh, the port city and uh, how it affects to the Colombo uh, urban area, the climate change issue. Um, yeah, so the what I tried to show is that uh, the port city will create a completely different morphology or a shape to the city. And we know that the port city's uh, location also creates a uh, an impact rather because most of our wind movement uh, that we get into the city is from the uh, from the west no southwest or most most of the time it is due west because of the ocean because of the ocean's impact we are uh, the wind regime within Colombo city is uh, is helped. Uh, now, with this uh, high-rise block uh, that uh, abuts the central business district, it can have um, significant impacts. Not only the shape of the old city for itself, but also for the um, old city, Fort Peta, that area. And then, uh, because of that, we need to be aware of that. And then, how we can uh, build responsibly and uh, with knowledge. Yes, thank you, sir. So uh, an another question, how to mitigate the uh, conditions in the uh, highly dense areas in Colombo? Yes, so the mitigation aspects of it, uh, can have uh, several aspects. If you talk, because we are talking about in the urban outdoors or urban outdoor thermal comfort or urban heat island, uh, there are several ways we can use, um, uh, we can avoid radiation getting absorbed, that is shading. We can use ventilation, we can use urban greenery, or we can uh, reflect the incoming solar radiation. Uh, by having high albedo, etc. So choice of materials um, in that aspect. So within those four critical areas, we can mitigate. These cannot be afterthoughts. These um, aspects have to be uh, taken at an early design stage. So design stage doesn't mean that the building uh, scale. It, can, it has to be at the urban scale itself. So in understanding what drives urban heat island, we can avoid by taking, um, uh, thinking of how we can shade, how we can ventilate, how we can use greenery to shade, ventilate and increase evaporation, etc. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, any more questions? Yes, we, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, so if you have any questions, please direct them within four minutes. Yeah, uh, maybe that's all. Right. Okay, then, uh, yeah, one, uh, uh, no. one, one is asking. Okay, that's all, that's no. all. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I, I would Hello. like to Yes, yes. Yes, I am Neil. Yes. Hello. Go ahead. Hello, Neil. Uh, why are you, uh, why uh, not... Uh, uh, discuss about green or sustainable housing uh, for uh, reduce the heat of the urban areas. It is uh, important. Uh, I think sustainable sustainable housing uh, we can apply to 
uh, that concept for the uh, reduce the heat about uh, in a in a urban area yes agreed so not only the so housing is a particular typology no but all uh, building uses will have to be done sustainably not only housing our, our different uh, users uh, like um, the highest uh, energy consumers are mostly commercial yeah. in terms of energy so all of them have to be sustainable. So I agree that uh, sustainable housing yeah. is important. And then we alluded to not only uh, the, the high-rise form of housing. No, we can have high-density, low-rise housing, high-density, mid-rise housing. Yeah. All uh, areas that are conducive for people to occupy. So that's a very important factor that you raised, Neil, where... Yeah. Um, how people use and live in cities uh, is a critical factor. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. So uh, with that, I'd like to wind up the session. And uh, uh, my sincere thanks goes to uh, today's speaker, Dr. Narayan Pereira, the Chartered Architect. Thank you for having me. And yes. uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be involved in the Green Building Council of Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, I wish uh, everybody who have attended, uh, hopefully uh, they were, so I was able to give you a few uh, points for, for food for thought uh, in your um, future endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.